Uh, we'll start on this end with Mr. Montgomery. And go ahead. Two minutes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. How about we're some excited Democrats? Um, it is an honor to be here with you on tonight. I'm Beryl Montgomery. I have the great honor of serving currently in the North Carolina General Assembly, uh, House District 72 in Forsyth County. Uh, prior to serving in the General Assembly, I served nearly 10 years on the Winston-Salem City Council. I know you look and you're saying, well, how's this young kid served that long? Uh, I started early. Um, at 21, um, I got elected to the Winston-Salem City Council as a senior at Winston-Salem State University, re-elected in 2013, re-elected again in 2016, um, and then made a transition to the North Carolina General Assembly. Over that time frame, I've worked uh, in uh, elected office to improve the quality of life for all folks in our communities, whether it's been working on affordable housing, making sure that economic development had opportunities for all people in all walks of life, whether it's been at the state uh, level, ensuring that we're fighting and pushing back against Republicans to ensure that we expand Medicaid or ensure that we're investing in teacher pay and increase opportunities uh, for job and job creation across the state of North Carolina. I got into this race in particular, though, because of what I do for a living. Um, I serve as an executive director of the largest provider of homeless services in Forsyth County. And in that work, I see the holes in our systems. Uh, I see the holes where we <coughs> engage with homeless veterans who come home who've been dishonorably discharged, uh, who have to navigate a system to connect them back. I engage with families with children uh, who, uh, for no fault of a parent who works every day, uh, they've been evicted from their homes, not because their mother or their father doesn't work and they arrive with black trash bags with all their belongings, but because 725 is not a living wage and we have to improve the quality of pay that we have for individuals. Or whether for the quality of seniors in our community, the 82-year-old uh, who arrived at our doorstep, who only survives off of uh, her Social Security check. And because of that, Time she up. lost her home. I'm sorry. Those are the reasons why I'm running for this race, because we need someone who has that perspective, who understands everyday issues, and who can go on day one to fight for each and every one of us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Give me the same Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I'm Bruce Davis, and it is an honor and a privilege to be here uh, to address you and let me let you all know uh, why I am running for Congress. But before I do that, let me give you a little bit about me. Most of you know me, but some of you don't. So when I was an 18-year-old, I went down to MEPS and I took that solemn oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And so since I've been 18, I've been serving our community, our country, and that's all I know. So when I moved back home, I saw that many things had not changed in my community. So I got involved in a civic organization, and they say, be careful what you ask for. I ended up on the board of commissioners. I was the chairman of the largest board of commissioners in the state of North Carolina at that time, a leader amongst leaders. And so also, after serving in the military and becoming a county commissioner, my wife and I started a business. We've been in business for 22 years. We have set the basic educational foundation for thousands of ch children in our community. That's what we do for a living, and I'm proud to say that we have an NC pre-kindergarten program that serves our community, and we've been giving back. Now, one thing about my candidacy, what makes me different, uh, is that I am a business owner, and I started business with absolutely nothing. And from absolutely nothing to running a business with a $1.5 million annual operating income. Good, that's the yellow one. And uh, so uh, we, are, we, are, we are pleased to know that we get back to the community. Uh, we, I've been serving, as I said, all of my life. I want to go to Washington and be your voice. When you send me to Washington, then you're going to Washington too. You will have a seat at the table because I will take your ideas to Washington and we will come up with solutions together. Vote Bruce Davis for your next 6th Congressional District Congressman. Uh, anybody else come on in and have a seat? There's seats back here. Okay. Okay. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. 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 I am not Kathy Manning and I am not Rhonda Fox. <laughs> My name is Deidre James and I am Kathy Manning's political 
political director. Kathy couldn't be here this evening, so we were told we were going to be given an opportunity to read a written statement on her behalf. So here we go. Dear fellow Democrats, I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight. This town hall overlapped with a commitment I made several months ago. In my absence, I asked Deidre to share the following letter with you. First, thank you for being here tonight and for your commitment to making our district and country better. It's the dedication of people like you that will help us chart a new course for the future of our country. Many of you know me, but for those of you who don't, I want to share a bit about myself. I've been living in Greensboro for more than 30 years. I built my career as an immigration attorney, raised my family here, and worked within our community to bring people together to get big projects done. Over the years, I've worked with the United Way to expand early access to childhood education. I worked with the Community Foundation to provide food and mortgage relief during the Great Recession. And I've worked for years to spur economic development and began to replace some of the jobs and investment we lost during the late 1990s and early 2000s. I've also been privileged to serve on the Board of Trustees at UNCG and on the Bennett College Reengineering Committee helping to make sure our universities are accessible to all students. Do I have that to count for me, too? This is all I'm going to tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got more. Excuse me. So anyway, um, in 2018, I was willing to take on a tough race for Congress because I was deeply worried about the future of our country. With the help of many of you, we were able to build a, we were able to build a solid Republican district toss-up in, in a matter of months. I am deeply proud of the work we did. The doors we knocked on, phone calls we made, and the messages that we got out. I'm running in this newly redrawn 6th district to finish what we started. I love to be able to say everything we ran on the last time has been changed, but unfortunately the opposite is true. We are moving in the wrong direction on the issues that matter to us most. Health care, education, environment, criminal justice reform, women's rights, affordable housing, and Time's gun violence. Sorry. Y'all said we can read a whole letter. <laughs> <laughs> Early voting starts on Thursday, and I'm asking for your vote. I want to go to Washington to stand up to the Trump Republican agenda and fight for all of us. Thank you again for being here today. I look forward to seeing you soon. In solidarity, Kathy Nanny. Thank you. Thank you. If you read a little bit faster, you might have gotten <laughs> No, I think I sent it out because you didn't uh, you did. There are people back here too, so make sure that you know you direct your comments that way. Uh, Mr. Haynes, I think you are probably next. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And uh, Good thank evening. you all for coming tonight. My name is Ed Haynes. Uh, I served as the uh, uh, House of Representatives member from District 72 in Winston-Salem for six years. I uh, served on any number of committees from finance to education. And what I want to talk to you all tonight is something very simple. It's about, it's about home. It's about being from this area and understanding what it means to be of and serve this community. Uh, I've been uh, from, I'm from this area. I've been here for 40 plus years. My family has been a member of this community in the Winston-Salem neighborhood of the Boston community for 119 years and counting, serving as educators. So we understand what it means to be of and serve the community. What really will set me apart, what really sets me apart from the rest of the candidates that you will hear is my slate of legislation that we had that spoke to social justice and education. And I've been doing it from day one. I've been doing it at the highest level of state government. We passed three bills of great importance to this state that have changed and saved lives. The first bills we did were $30 million in body cam, dash cam, and police training legislation. We did that day one. That bill passed and there are more police officers in this state right now wearing body cameras and having training than ever before. That saves lives and it speaks directly to our community from an accountability standpoint. The second bill we passed was a wrongful conviction and exoneration bill. There were people in this state who were being wrongfully convicted, exonerated, and still uh, having an arrest record associated with them. Daryl Hunt went to his grave with an arrest record. That is not right. Ladies and gentlemen, I can cut through the noise in Washington, D.C. I proved it as a member of the General Assembly, and I will prove it again to you when you send me to Congress to be your next representative from this district. Thank you very much. Come on in, please. Come on in and have a seat. 
There's seats back here. There's maybe one back there. <coughs> Everybody come on in, please. Okay. All right. Ms. <coughs> Fox. Sure. Good evening, and my sincerest apologies for coming in late. It has been a full day in the district, but my name is Rhonda Fox, and I am running for U.S. Congress here in North Carolina's 6th Congressional District. Folks ask, why are you running? I'm running because in the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I come from the school of Shirley Chisholm, who told us if you're not given a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Who told us that we are unbossed and we are unbought. And that's why I'm in this race. You see, my whole life has been about service and hard work. My father is a retired Army officer who went through ROTC right at North Carolina a and and my mother a proud Spartan who's a public educator. And they taught me the value of hard work and never giving up. And that's why I've worked for six different women in federal government <coughs> and politics. Most recently as Chief of Staff to our forever Congresswoman, Congresswoman Alma Adams. And in that time as a Chief of Staff, I was the youngest woman of color Chief of Staff on Capitol Hill. And I saw there that the people's house doesn't look like the people's in this room. And it is imperative that we all have the ability to bring our folding chair. And that's what this race is about. You see, I have the experience to get things done on day one for us. As a staffer, I got $200 million for HBCUs through the HBCU Steam Day of Advocacy, which I designed and implemented. As a staffer, as many of you have read, after I went through our broken criminal justice system, I got a million dollars for public defense and for court technology through House Appropriations. I know how to get things done. And I'm ready to get back to do that. Imagine what I would do as a member for our community. But whatever you may say, whatever your issues may be from your community, I want you to know I've got a fire in me to keep fighting for us because I've lived our everyday issues. I've seen my mom drive an hour and 45 minutes each way and seeking a better care. I have $185,000 worth of educational debt. I've gone through our broken criminal Sorry, justice system, up. and I will get us through that. Thank you. precinct chair. It is um, more red than blue, but we do have blue. And my question to you is, how will you in, uh, speak to the rural voters? How, do you have a, a plan for how Trump's trade wars have impacted our farmers? <coughs> those are the people that live where I live. Okay. Uh, Mr. Haynes, let's just start and come down the road here. Time. Go. Uh, you get two minutes. Okay. So the first thing that I would, I'm sorry, ma oh, yes. The first thing that I would do, yes, ma'am. The first thing that I would do is speak, is, is speak to those voters from a place that we can all relate, and that is a, a place from, of, of education. And so one of, the, one of the pieces of legislation that I ran and got passed while I was in the General Assembly during my third session was a piece of legislation that spoke directly to rural folks, it spoke directly uh, to folks who may not be uh, the most affluent in the urban in the urban districts that are often just focused here in Greensboro, Winston Salem, and it was a bill that spoke to the fact that we have a number of students who were uh, free and reduced lunch, low income, you know, kids who were struggling, who were scoring fives on their state on their end of grade test, and they were being denied advancement or opportunity to take advanced math, and rich kids kids largely from urban environments were being put in those places. And so we can't, first of all, separate our state by rural, urban, although there are those differences, but we have to be able to speak to everybody where we can connect. And that is from an education standpoint, that's from a uh, student standpoint. And so what we did is make sure that that was never going to happen again, that 8,000 kids will be in advanced math this year, 15,000 next, and 30,000 the next year. 
from an ag from an agricultural standpoint, or you can talk to the rural voters there, people who work in the manufacturing, people who work in the ag, people want jobs. We can talk about what we did from a job standpoint. I'll talk to them about the fact that I was ranked the number eight legislator, regardless of party, for job creation by the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce. I've done it. I've been there. I've done it at the highest level. And if you elect me, I can tell you once again, I'll be able to go in. I'll be able to make the relationships. I'll be able to work across the aisle, which is what I did, which is what your folks want to hear. They want to know I'm not going to go there and ignore them. I spent my first, I spent my first 30 days in the North Carolina General Assembly in a Republican supermajority going to every member's office sitting down. How are you? My name is Ed Haynes. This is what I'm about. What can we work on together? And because of that, I was able to create those relationships very early. I was able to get bills passed that others could not get passed and would not get passed. Time's up. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Montgomery. Um, when we think about our, our rural voters, the fact of the matter is, is that um, many individuals across our state have, have an understanding that or a thought process that folks don't care about them in, in the rural communities. The fact is, I, I, I grew up in a rural community. Um, even when I go and visit my mom and dad now, I know the challenge of uh, them not having broadband access. And so they use a Verizon hotspot that only gets them about six gigabytes. Uh, and if anyone uses data, that's not a problem. Uh, the fact of not having connection to technology in many places simply because infrastructure has not been built out. Part of the problem and the challenges that we have is that we have to engage all of our community. And whether you're in urban areas or you're in rural areas, we have to connect those dots. That's why, um, as I've been uh, serving in the legislature now, uh, I've supported the expansion of, of rural broadband in our, across our state so that we can make sure we're connecting individuals. But even more than that, I shared on this past Saturday at another one of our forums that one of the things that we have to do, agriculture uh, is still a big part of the economics in the state of North Carolina. And so if we're going to continue to expand economics, we have to focus on how we equip folks in our rural communities to expand. So I shared one of the proposals that I have in, at the federal level, and that is what I'm calling uh, the Farming Modernization Act. What that would do, it would essentially set up a fund uh, that would help farmers in our rural communities modernize their farming tactics. Because as we continue to grow, we have to equip folks to be able to expand and to be able to grow different crops, particularly with the tariffs that have been in, uh, have impacted many individuals. And what that we will be allowing for them to do in that same bill is to move forward with uh, the legalization of marijuana across the state, particularly focusing on medicinal marijuana first, because we have folks who are struggling right now for medical reasons who don't have access. And if we in North Carolina and across this country legalize marijuana, North Carolina can be a next exporter for our rural farmers for, so that they can have a new cash crop so that they can continue to thrive and to move forward. I think we have to look at those type of policies that equip folks in rural, rural communities to let them know that we care about them and we're thinking Time. about processes that can move them forward. Okay, Mr. Davis. But the truth to the matter is uh, Trump's uh, policies have crippled American farmers. It has really uh, hurt our American farmers and especially here in Guilford County, the trade policies that he put in place tend to really hurt us. And we have to talk about not only that, but environmental issues, at which directly impacts the, the farming community. And so we've got to talk about climate change. So many of the Republicans do not believe that there's such a thing as climate change, but it really affects the farmers. Ask any farmer, they'll tell you how it really, in, in uh, climate change is, is hurting. And we need to address those policies. We need to be a part of those climate, uh, uh, those uh, uh, different policies that helps uh, farmers to, to advance their products. And so there are so many ways, but the biggest thing is sitting down and talking to farmers in our community and making sure that we understand the issue because every, every community is not the same. And we do need to have a message that <coughs> speaks exactly to our farmers. And that comes from sitting down at the table. As I said before, when I go to Washington, I bring your voice, I bring your issues to the table, and that's so important. No person will know or have the answer to everything, but you've got to be willing to sit down and listen, study those issues, put together a good team who can address those issues, and come up with good policy that fits this area. So unfortunately, there's two messages to the urban voter and to the farming community. But that's the way it is, and we'll work through that issue as we work through other issues in the urban community as well. Thank you.
two part question. So the first part, when we look at the rural and the urban divide, we got a lot of divides. We got divides between black folks, white folks, brown folks. We've got divides between rich folks, folks who are in underserved communities. Here's the issue. It doesn't matter what you look like or where you're from, urban or rural. You want to have a belief in the American dream. You want someone to fight for your right to make a living wage, to put a roof over your head and food on your table. And that's what we have to do, elect people with those priorities. And that's the message for all the areas. No student in the inner cities or in the inner urban parts of Greensboro should have a better opportunity than a child in Warnersville, Kernersville, or any other community, Sedalia. And so we have to fight for that, believe in that. When it comes to trade, we are still ravished from NAFTA. NAFTA took our jobs, it, it, it ruined our manufacturing infrastructure that we have. To have a president that politicizes trade the way that Donald Trump has done to defend every North Carolinian. You cannot politicize a trade war like he did. That disrupts our markets and it disrupts our people and our economy. And so it's on us as Democrats to stand united in this moment and to stand up and to say you can't politicize our economy cannot politicize trade, and come heck and high water on November, we will be unified as a party to elect someone that will stop Donald Trump. And I think when we speak to our folks in rural areas and we speak to our folks in the middle or to Republicans, this is dollars and cents. When you mess with trade, you mess with our pocketbooks. When you mess with our pocketbooks, you mess with our economy. And that's something none of us, regardless of party affiliation, should tolerate. All right, um, we are going to continue with questions. Deidre is going to make a closing statement <coughs> on behalf of uh, Miss Manning, but she is not going to answer questions, and I don't blame her. <laughs> <laughs> and just let me say, um, because we didn't get to finish the entire letter, we will be taking all of these questions back and replying to them, posting them on our website, and emailing them to anyone who has put their information down. So, thank you. Okay, next question comes from David Brown. I think uh, it shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us that we're very rapidly becoming a surveillance society. We've got drones in the air overhead that you really have very little control over. We've got facial recognition uh, cameras taking our pictures everywhere. Our personal data is being spread thin all over the, the world. Any piece of information that can be found out about me, if I, no matter how it can be found, is made available to anyone who wants to buy it. I want to know what you as a candidate would do in Congress to help solve this issue. And I'd like to see a Personal Data Privacy Act that would allow me as an individual to control who gets to see my information, under what conditions, and gets me, lets me lock down that information. And if I can't lock it down, then it has to be encrypted on whatever storage device it's on, no matter where it is in the country. We'll start with Mr. Montgomery and work this way and then go back to Mr. <coughs> How many of you have one of these in, in the room? You have one? <laughs> you are being tracked right now. Uh, uh, your, your position, where you go today right now, when you get home, if you have an iPhone, you can open up your iPhone, and it can, if you go on your, uh, your general settings, it will tell you all of the frequent, frequently uh, visited places. So if you go places you don't want folks to know about, you better change your settings. Um, but part of the challenge is exactly what you stated, the fact of who gets access uh, to the data that's there. Um, there have been several um, uh, security measure bills that have come forward and that have been sponsored um, in, in Washington, D.C., but part of the challenge is that we have not had the courage to move forward um, uh, with one of those, uh, any of those proposals that have come forward. Particularly one of the things that we have to really take advantage of is, is new technology that come forth, such as blockchain technology, that has the ability to securely store the type of data that you're talking about. But it, it means that we have to remove the commercialization of, of our data. The fact of the matter is the reason that we have not had policy that's come forward that's really put the data back in our pockets and back in our control is because it is a money maker for folks out there to sell the data to another group of individuals. So until we elect individuals who have the courage to say that we're not going to commercialize individual personal data, 
we're not going to have that type of policy to move forward. And so I think we have to have that as a part of our advocacy, a part of our fight, and to hold elected officials accountable uh, to the type of companies who are donating and supporting individuals who currently serve in Washington, D.C., and that we push the technology that has the ability to make sure that we get that back in our hands. We've seen that even with, our, with the issues at Facebook and with the selling of data. Um, and we see that the response from that has pushed the corporation like Facebook to even begin to look at more options on how we can have more control over the data that's there. They're going to be moving forward with a few additional um, components that will, again, allow individuals to have individual access to what's released and what's not. But that only happened after folks found out uh, what was being done and how it was being sold. So there's two, two pieces to it. One, we have to hold our elected officials accountable, push forward new, um, uh, push forward new, um, new technology, Time. and thirdly, uh, ensure uh, that the individuals whom we elect have Mr. the courage Davis. to do it. Yes, <laughs> thank you. And I don't know that I can explain any better than what was just explained. We do need personal data uh, privacy uh, acts that will make sure that your data is safe and it's not being sold. The biggest problem is lobbyists on, on Capitol Hill. They make lots of money to push legislation that favors them so that they can sell your data. How many times you've been talking to someone and your phone say, could you repeat, repeat that, please? I know I've had it. Maybe yours haven't. Maybe you're smarter than me and you've turned off the locator on your phone and all this good stuff. But uh, somebody's telling me to stand out here. I'm trying to get a good view here of everybody. Uh, but anyway, I, I think that we, we have to be bold enough. Uh, to make sure that we bring this issue to the table and that, uh, and that we write legislation, that we sit down and really study the issue and uh, not just throw a solution in it, but we study it and we make sure that it is your personal data that is protected <coughs> under Protection Act. So that's, I don't know if we can get any better than that. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think it's one of the biggest issues that we face in this moment. When I go back to why am I running, these are the everyday issues that we're just not moving on in Washington because we're caught behind a veil of theatrics and ugly politics. And there's no reason in the world that we have not passed comprehensive data collection and data privacy legislation. The next war that we fight as a nation won't be done on the battlefield. It will be done cyber. And we haven't invested in our infrastructure to enhance our cybersecurity as a nation. And I'll tell you, the biggest threat to it is what will happen to our economy. Because <coughs> we have a cyber breach, that's billions of dollars that we're losing. And Congress isn't going to talk about this right now because it's not theatrical. Pardon my language, but it's not the sexiest topic. But yet, it's the most great. And that's why we need folks to understand what it is when your data is breached by Target, what it is when your data is breached by Experian. As a chief of staff, when this happened, um, we had the big data breach with Experian. We did a uh, letter. We did the coalition building amongst Democratic members who were ranking members, meaning they were the second highest powerful Democrat on their various committees, to step up on behalf of all of their constituents and ask their colleagues in Congress to actually move meaningful data security. We do that as staffers. We understand that that's important. And so I think if we are able as a, as a, as a people to say, leave those theatrics behind, and let's return to these everyday issues, <laughs> then we can pass comprehensive data collection just like the EU did. Europe did it. Why can't we? Thank you. Yes, so I was, um, I, was, I was honored and lucky enough to actually serve on the IT committee. Uh, I was one of uh, two or three Democrats who had an opportunity to serve on that committee with Representative Jason saying, and this is exactly the type of issue that we were looking at at the time because of the different data breaches that we had going on even in the state of North Carolina. It's a very serious thing. I think all of my colleagues have, have said, it, uh, said it great. Uh, we have to look at it. We have to, be, uh, we, have, we, we have to be brave. We have to be courageous. We have to be willing to step up and step out against the Facebooks, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Apples and anyone and everyone else, but we also have to do it in a way where we recognize that we are in a different place you know, in this country. Business, uh, with regard to, to data security and how they're dealing with your data, it's there. They're never, they're never going back, and so we have to be in a place where we can develop trust with these leaders, bring them into the room, get them to the table, and have them understand that we as Americans understand where business is going, we understand where the future is going, but we're not going to be taken advantage of with regard to them making money um, making money uh, off of our backs, so to speak. 
I would also say that one of the things we really need to be careful about, really need to look at and understand where data is going, is <coughs> in the area of what's going to happen when artificial intelligence really comes to the forefront and really starts digging in on what we're doing. Uh, if you think the Republican Party had a field day with the data they were able to get and manipulate through different uh, computer programs this time in terms of how they drew the districts. The first way you prevent that is not to elect Republicans. The second way, <laughs> the second way, the second way you prevent it is to get people involved on the ground in artificial intelligence and coding and understand, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, there are machines now. There's artificial intelligence now that can take a million different scenarios, figure it out in a matter of nanoseconds. If you think they can carve districts now, you wait until artificial intelligence gets involved with it and they can do it in nanoseconds. Time. Thank you. All right, next question, and we'll begin with uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, Jim Bennett. Did anybody on this side have any questions? Well, I'm a senior, and uh, I would like to know how you address the problems of uh, those of us who are seniors. Uh, I'm particularly interested in what your views are on Social Security and health care for us. Okay. So, um, health care and Social Security. We all know that Social Security is, is kind of in trouble, but it is, it is the best thing that we have right now to, to make sure that you have some type of pension when you retire. We have questions about it in the future, but right now, it is still uh, uh, something that works for all of us. Um, the Affordable Care Act is, is I think you asked about health, I did. health care. I think the Affordable Health Care or the ACA is the best thing that we have right now. It kind of started off just like Social Security where people thought it was a socialist <laughs> program, but it wasn't. And it proved to be a good program, one of the programs that you can count on as a senior to draw something from it. Affordable Care Act allows you to, to have some insurance and that, I mean, you know, I have employees, 25 employees, that did not have insurance before the Affordable Care Act came along. Of course, they're not seniors, but uh, I'm very um, interested in the, making sure that our seniors have uh, uh, prescription drugs, uh, that they are taken care of when they have uh, pre-existing conditions. And so these are all issues that uh, I think the Affordable Care Act addresses at this point right now. Now, it's got a few flaws in it that we need to tweak, but I'm certainly not one to throw out the baby with the bathwater and try to do something any different than what we have. So we can also talk about other issues that you may have with, um, with health care for our seniors, but we've got to take care of those who have taken care of us. It's just like our veterans. We have to take care of our veterans the same way that they've taken care of us. We have a lot of veterans who are seniors right now, and uh, it concerns me that we don't, we don't uh, do a good job in this country of taking care of you medical-wise, prescription drugs, and, um, and just uh, those things alike. So thank you for that question. legislation in the U.S. Congress, the Older Americans Act. You have my word that I wouldn't just be a yes vote on that, but an actual advocate and stand up to ensure that if you work hard and you have a pension plan, you deserve your pension. If you are a senior citizen who has given your life to military service, you deserve your benefits. We have to all stand up and fight for that. When it comes to a lot of systems, they'll tell you we can't afford that. We can't pay for that. We can't pay for Social Security. We can't pay for Medicare for all. That's not true. We pay for prisons. We pay for wars. If we do that, we can pay for health care. And if we don't pay for health care for all, then we'll continue to have disparities within our health care system. There is no reason in the world we should have a health care system where your zip code and your skin tone determines your outcome. And so that just requires having people with the courage to stand up and say, we don't have to fund that war over there. And I'm a military doctor. We can fund health care. And so I'm willing to champion that. And not just with yes votes or statements, but actually in our community fighting for it. Because I believe in that. And so I think we can all move forward towards these common goals if we elect folks where we ask, what are your priorities? Where are you going to go into that appropriations room 
and go in front of Nita Lowy as well as her staffer Shalonda Young and say, I need this pass. I need this money for this because it is a priority of the 6th Congressional District. And so if our priorities are lockstep with our needs, then we will get things done as universal health care. Sir, I, I can promise you that every candidate up here is going to is going to say that we want to make sure that everybody is taken care of from a health care from a health care standpoint. There's a lot of confusion out there about you know the difference between the American Care Act and single payer and Medicare for all. And the truth about it is this: we have a movement in the Democratic Party right now. And there are some differences, but we have a movement in the Democratic <coughs> Party right now to put it all under one umbrella, and it's because it means so many different things to so many people. Frankly, you know, the American Care Act is a, series, it's a series of laws that are geared to protect and give everyone good health care, right? Medicare for all is a, to is a type of single-payer system, and I'm telling you right now, we have to be on the track toward getting toward the point where all Americans are covered, and they're covered for their entire lives. We want whole life policies. <laughs> We want to make sure that we're not calling it the American, the American Care Act. I'm going to call it Obamacare because he cared about it, he did it, he pushed it, and he did it when no one else really wanted to do it and he was able to drive it home. And so we're going to do those type of things. We want to concentrate on those type of things. You have to elect people who are going to support it. You have to elect people who are going to support the leadership that would push those types of, uh, push those types of concepts forward. We had a candidate in this race who spent a whole year when she was running against Ted Budd saying that she would not vote for Nancy Pelosi. She spent a whole year doing it. And when I'm telling you right now that when I go to Washington, D.C., I'm going to vote for Nancy Pelosi. I'm going to vote for the leadership that just impeached Donald Trump. We're going to do it over and over again until we get the kind of health care in this country that we need and until we put people on the spot as politicians who we will not elect when they spend a year saying they will not uh, support a leader who has done everything she can to move this country forward. Thank you. So Jim, I think uh, you, you hit a really, really great question because when we think about our seniors um, and we think about those who are dependent upon Social Security and are looking at the, the, the twilight years of their life and how they're going to enjoy the rest of the thing to take care of everybody else. We have to ask the question of how we're going to preserve it. I, I want to get there one day. Um, as you say, I'm, I'm probably about 40 years away from even qualifying. <laughs> uh, but the fact is this. When we think about Social Security and preserving Social Security, we got to understand policy. And the fact is, is right now, for individuals who make, I think the, the cap is about $115,000, we stop taxing for Social Security. Right. But those individuals who are making a million dollars, $600,000, a billion dollars, <coughs> Anything above that $115,000 is no longer taxed for Social Security. So we're saying that you don't need to pay any more. And the fact is that that's just not fair to the system overall if we're going to continue to push forward. So that's one of the policy things that we have to do to change. When it comes to, to universal health care, universal health care access, I've been a very, very clear advocate from the very beginning uh, of this race and consistently that the fact is, is that we can't settle as Democrats of not moving forward on universal care. The fact is, is when we pass the ACA, uh, it was Democrats in control of the House and the Senate. And we were talking about universal health care, but Democrats couldn't come together to push forward universal health care. we got to have advocates in the room who will stand up to our fellow Democrats to say that if and when we take back control of the Senate, we cannot fail the American people again by not having the courage to move forward the policy that's going to be transformative for the people across this country. <laughs> Was there anybody on this side of the room that put a paper in here? Okay, would you please stand and ask your question? Give, give your name first. Hey, um, hi, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jasmine Thomas. I am a senior at North Carolina UT. Um, and so my question is, with the implementation of President Trump's global gag rule and the increasing number of policy-level attacks on women's reproductive rights, what have you done to protect the health of women in this country? Oh, that's the response. Good question. Did you? Did 
do it. I think but probably Miss Fox will address the question in such a way that you'll figure out what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. And as a young person coming out here and asking such an important question and being a part of this process, kudos to you. Um, when it comes to women's issues, they are all of our issues. This district is over 50% women. <coughs> And if women aren't doing well, none of us are doing well. And so when it comes to women's reproduction rights, unequivocal, all day, every day, a woman's choice is a woman's choice. And we as a party, we are actually the pro-life party. Because we don't just say a fetus should, that's a woman's choice. But we protect our children from the day they're born all the way to their 99. We fight for children to have access to health care education. We fight for women to have access to Planned Parenthood. And I will continue to be a proud advocate for women's rights. And I am proud to be the only candidate in this race that called for a forum on women's issues. And only one candidate up here took the time to respond to that forum request. But we are going to march on. And your question today gave me the courage to continue to march on that we can talk about women's reproduction rights. What are the plans that we can ensure that Roe v. Wade isn't attacked, that we have folks in Congress that are willing to codify a woman's right to choose. We're not going to fight the battles of yesteryear. You don't have to fight that battle again. We're going to fight that for you. And it's not just a woman's right to choice. Women's access to capital. We earn more degrees. We vote more. But yet, we don't have access to capital. Gentlemen, if you have a wife, you got a sister, you got a daughter, you got an aunt, you got a mother, imagine if she made equal pay for equal work. You would make more. This is an issue for all of us, and we all must stand on that. And I will call on my colleagues in this race to join me in having this conversation in this forum about women's issues. Thank you. So, I um, have a mother, have two grandmothers, uh, most, most importantly, I um, have two sisters, and I have two little girls. Uh, my daughters are 8 and 12 years old. And so the issue of a woman's right to choose has been one, oh, the issue of a woman's right to choose has been one that has been a fireside and tabletop discussion. Uh, in our house for my entire, my entire life. Uh, every single solitary bill that this repressive Republican Party in Raleigh tried to bring to make it so a woman would not have a right to choose, I stood up against, I spoke up against, and I voted against. I didn't do it just because of my mother and my sisters and my daughters and my grandmother. I did it because it's the right thing. And that's what we have to think about when we think about what's going on and the attacks and the unwarranted attacks that are going on with women and their right to choose. You do it because it's the right thing. You do it because it's already decided law. It's not something that we're going to go back and take a look at again. I'm not going to. It's something that we have to do because it's the only way that we can ensure that women have the right to choose their, they have the right to choose their degrees, they have the right to choose their field of study, they have the right to choose anything and everything they want to choose without being blocked, without some man telling them what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. It's never going to happen again as long as I remain with breath in my lungs. And when I go to Washington, I can promise you, I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to fight for my daughters and my sisters and my mother and my grandmother, but I'm going to fight because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Um, oftentimes in these races, you, you, you have candidates, and uh, we tell you what we're going to do, and, and, and we ask you to trust that when we get to elected office that we're going to do what it is that we say that we're going to do. Um, and I'm one of the candidates in this race who, who are not just asking you to trust what I'm going to do, but to check my record on what I've already done. Um, as an elected official and, and sitting in the chamber, uh, when Republicans brought forward their abortion bill, I voted against it when it passed out of the House and passed out of the Senate, 
And when they came to try to override Governor Roy Cooper's veto, I stood with Planned Parenthood and Roy Cooper to not vote against it, the override of his veto to make sure that we stood with women across the state of North Carolina. And not only that, but if you go and check record that I am one of the co-sponsors uh, for uh, ratification of ERA in the state of North Carolina to move forward uh, with insurance. Uh, that, that we preserve and increase opportunity for women across uh, not only this state, but I think at the national level we have to move forward. Um, uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, 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 Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, I think, was quoted today uh, on, on the fact of what we need to do in reference to the ERA. Um, and, and I, too, believe that as a part of our conversation in this race, we have to continue to talk about uh, women's rights and understand where candidates are, what they have done, and what they plan to continue to do. And so I am that candidate that joined in and said that I would join Ms. Fox in having a conversation about women's rights because I believe it's important. I have two little, little nieces. Um, and one uh, plays basketball uh, and, and the other um, uh, who uh, is three. Um, I think about what a world looks like that embraces them. What a world looks like for them 20 years from now. And whether or not they have to ask the questions that we're asking in this room today. And the fact is that I will have failed as their uncle if I didn't do everything that I could in this moment to make sure that they don't have to ask those questions 20 years from now. That's my commitment. That's who I've been. That's why I want to continue to be as your next congressperson for the 6th District. First, let me set the record uh, straight. Let's be clear. My campaign was the campaign that responded to the request to uh, sit and talk about, have that conversation about women. Uh, as you can see, yes, uh, my, my entire staff, except for one, uh, we're, we're talking about are women. Um, I have 25 women I employ. My best friend is a woman, my wife right there. Okay. And those 25 women who work for my company, trust me, they keep me in line, they keep me focused, and I, I have to deal with women issues every single day. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's a natural thing. So imagine a world where everybody who made policies were women. Imagine that the women decided, I know one day we'll probably get there, but women decided that men, fellas, listen to me, men, listen to me. The women decided what we can do with our bodies and what we cannot do with our bodies. How does that feel? How does that sound? Sounds kind of ridiculous. So I think it is ridiculous that we would impose such uh, archaic rules on women. We should not be uh, fighting the, uh, that anymore. It's, it's, it's a done deal. Uh, so I think that uh, we have to respect our women's right to choose, and uh, it's a good thing. It, it certainly is a good thing. It's good for everybody to have a right to, to do what they need to do with their body, okay, whether it's to, uh, to, to have children or not to have children. That's a decision be between you, the woman, and, and her God. And we should not even, it should not even be in the legislature, it should not even be in the political uh, 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 we shouldn't ha have to have this conversation because it is not politics. You can't legislate what a person, you should not legislate what a person will do and can do with their body. But some kind of way, the Republicans like to throw it in, in the discussion so that it keeps us off balance. And while we're fighting that, that fight, then they're passing rules and laws that, uh, that really uh, hurts all of us. And so... I will fight for anything, well, not anything. I'll fight for everything that, uh, that, uh, that the women will bring forth that, uh, that, that makes sense to us, which is good. I, I think we have time for uh, closing remarks. That will be uh, one minute, and then after that, if there are any other candidates here, I want you to just stand up. Tell us your name and what you're running for, and that's it, okay? Um, and remember, we want a photo shoot of all of you um, afterwards. And, you know, if, if you're willing to stay and talk to people individually, I'm sure they would appreciate it. Okay, Mr. Haynes, one minute for closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again. What I want you to take away uh, from this and remember about me is, one, I'm from here. I understand what it means to be from here, of here, and serve this district. 
the next thing I want you to take away is that I want you to think about that $30 million bills passed at the highest level of government in the state. I've already done it. $30 million for body cams. I want you to think about the fact that people are no longer, after we pass this in the Senate this time, people are no longer going to go to jail wrongfully and have an arrest record. I want you to think about it. That's a bill I passed. I want you to think about the fact that poor children in this state now are, who have earned their way into advanced math class are not going to be able to be pushed to the side any longer for children who have scored lower just because the kids make more money. That's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about the fact that I have cut through the noise in Raleigh. I have done it in Raleigh. I will do it again when I go to Washington, D.C. I will do it with integrity, and I will support our leadership. Thank you very much. When we think about where we are in this country, we got to have individuals who understand everyday people issues that are going to Washington, D.C. Um, if you don't have that perspective before you go to D.C., you're not going to get it when you get to D.C. And one of the things that I think separates me in this race is the fact that my uh, journey and my service has been working with everyday people, understanding everyday problems. And one of the things that I believe that we have to understand is that we have great candidates who are running, and I put it this way. I said, when you're looking for a great uh, mechanic to work in your car, you get the best mechanic in the world. Looking for a great architect to design a great home for you, you find the best architect that can design it. And then you go out and you find the best builder that can build it. When you're looking to have a heart transplant, you're looking for the best heart surgeon to perform that surgery. And right now, we have people who are in need of folks in Washington, D.C., who understand everyday people's problems and can make policy that makes a difference in their lives. And in this race, I believe that I'm that candidate who is most prepared, who understands everyday people's issues and challenges, not because I have all the answers, but I'm committed to always listening and understanding, and I've done the work. So I want your support, hope to earn it, and hope to see you at the polls. Thank you. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Now, we're all Democrats, and we all have the same, uh, pretty much the same take on the same issues and everything. But what distinguished my candidacy from the rest? I said in the beginning I took that solemn oath. And so one of the biggest things that, that a congressperson will do and possibly have to do is sign a declaration of war. And I am the only candidate who would understand the impact that that decision would have. Now, who would go to war? Will it be Donald Trump's children? Will it be the wealthy? It'll be your children. It'll be my children. And so I understand the impact that war would have on our community, the impact that it would have on the children, the impact that it would have on the economy. And so I think you want someone who understands that that's one of the biggest challenges that we face in a dangerous world that we live in. So elect Bruce Davis, send someone to Congress who understand the real critical issues. All the other issues, we will work through them because we'll have plenty of staff, we'll have plenty of attorneys, plenty of people who will work on these issues. And we'll have your voice at the table as well. Thank you. God bless you. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight and for allowing me to share some of my visions and goals with you. But what I will say is these are precarious times for our district. Our district is split in half between two conservative seats to dilute our Democratic voting strength and to dilute our voice. We've got this district as it stands for two years, 24 months. We don't have time for someone to learn how to get to the appropriations room or to the committee rooms. We need someone that can hit the ground running on day one, fighting for our issues and driving resources home. As much as I want to tell you though, that the most important race is this race, that you got to get to the polls today and check that box for Rhonda Fox. The realities are we've got a general assembly that we must take back. We have a senator, Tom Tillis, that we must defeat. And we have a governor, one of the only Southern Democratic governors, that we must reelect. Yes. And by all means, we must stop Donald Trump. Yeah. So we need someone that has the fire and the tenacity to get it done. And I am that person. Thank you. Ms. Manning, representatives here. And, and before she starts talking, those four people who have asked questions, uh, if you will, I will give her these slips. If you will come and give her your contact information and your question, she said that she will make sure that those are answered. Okay? 
Okay, so I'm not a politician, and I do not envy any of you all up here. There's a reason why I work for them, and I am not one. The reason why I'm working for Kathy Manny is because I believe she is the person to make this district the better district. Our team is not flown in from anywhere else. We are all born and raised in the 6th district. When we go to Washington, we will all be from the 6th district. Our campaign has tried our very best to rise above any bickering, name calling, any of that stuff. We're focused on you, your needs, and what's going to make this district the better district. That is why I am with Kathy. I stand with her. I stand by her. I will vote for her. And I hope you will do the same thing. Thank you. Okay, are there any candidates here? No? Yes. <laughs> Okay. I'm Mary Beth Murphy, and I'm running for Guilford County Commissioner in District Number Four. Say right here. I'm Carly Cook. I'm running for County Commissioner in District Five, and I do have a primary opponent, so I will be on the ballot on March third at the very bottom. I did bring a petition to Debbie Mathers. Okay. All right. Any other candidates? Um, are there any elected officials here? I understand that our DA is here. Avery Crump, I'm your elected district attorney. I'm not a candidate because I'm not up until 2022, but I thought this was very important for me to come out and support. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Okay, I would like to make an announcement on behalf of an unaffiliated candidate. Um, Deborah Knapper is running for county commissioner. School board. No, school board. School board. Sorry. District 5. District 5. District 5. There is only a Republican running uh, in that district. Uh, my understanding is that Deborah went to file to run as a Democrat, and she was going to change her affiliation the day she filed. But you have to change your affiliation, I think, 90 days ahead of filing. So she is in the process of getting enough signatures from her district. It has to be people from her district. It can be any party, any affiliation people from her district to sign a petition. So if you live in that district, what is it again? District 5. Oh, district like 5. Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge, Summerfield. Uh, it's not Oak Ridge. It's Summerfield, going down um, to Lake Jeanette, New Irving Park, down into Fisher Park. Right, right. It does go way on down. It's one of those squirrely <laughs> squir little districts. You have the precincts? Yeah, I've, okay. got the pre um, I've got the precincts for it. They may not know what precincts Well, if you do know, have, okay. it would be uh, another relevant way to <laughs> yeah. find out. So uh, if you're in CG1, CG2, G11, G12, G13, G14, G18, G19, G21, G22, G23, G27, G30, G31, G32, G40, A2, G40, B, G44, or NCGR1, NCGR2, or SF1, or SF2, then please sign the petition. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, you got it, Richard. Can I get out now? Big smile. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's all the business at hand. So come and take your photographs. Speak to the candidates. Okay. Um, Jim Bennett, David Brown, Linda Fuller, and Evan Yes.